Matthew chapter 13, 1 through 20. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon some stony places where, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold, 
who has ears to hear, let them hear.
something is less than something really, really insidious. Uh, when I used to go do um, communion with the elderly, seeking the shut in, and just seeing them, they're still praising. They're not, you know, oh, my body, oh, I'm, they're still praising. So that just shows me perseverance. Perseverance helps us to stay committed 
even when the results are not visible or delayed. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Amen. We, we were not going to always see immediate fruit from our labor. But do we stop? Do we quit? Do we give up? No, we, we keep on going. We keep on going, and we got to remember who we're going in. We're going in the name of Jesus. When you understand that whose name that you're going in, you can persevere your way. Amen. Because you understand that he said that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He said that if God be for you, who can be against you? I'm more than a conqueror because I have God. We have God standing with us, fighting beside us. Amen. So therefore, we can persevere our way on. So we won't always see immediate fruit for our, of our efforts in serving God or even living out kingdom values. However, perseverance helps us to stay committed even when the results are not displayed, not visible or delayed. When we have perseverance, we can go on when it seems there is no reason to go on. When we have perseverance, we can do our best part in the kingdom and watch God yield the results because we can't make nobody do nothing. I've learned that. We can't make anybody do anything. But what we can do is commit ourselves to perseverance. And in due time, what God, what we need, God will provide. What we need worked out, God is going to work it out. What we need fixed, he's going to fix it. Amen. But you got you to gotta persevere. The Bible says to be not weary in well-doing. For in due season, you got to wait till your due season. You got to persevere until due season comes. You shall reap if you faint not. So we can't always uh, make people do, especially grown people. I mean, grown people are quick to tell you, I'm grown, I do what I want to do, make my own decisions. So you have to be okay with grown people not doing what it is that you feel like they ought to be doing. Amen. But you got to remember who it is that has called you to your purpose. You got to remember who it is that has called you to your assignment. And you have to be diligent and persevering in the assignment that God has called you to. Because just like you have an assignment, my brothers and my sisters, your brothers and your sisters, they have an assignment on their life. But you got to do your best to persevere in your assignment. You're going to stand before the judgment for your assignment. You can't let the shortcomings or the lack thereof that you feel like in your brothers and sisters stop you or hinder you from doing what God has called you to do. Amen. In many of the parables, like the parable of the sower, Jesus speaks of how external pressures like persecution and internal struggles like temptations or distractions can cause people to fall away from the kingdom message. Perseverance is needed to withstand these trials and to remain faithful. You cannot be fruitful to God and lack perseverance. Okay, let me say that again. You cannot be, excuse me, you cannot be faithful to God and then lack perseverance because faithfulness to God requi requires that you know how to persevere. If you're going to be faithful to God, I mean, despite trials, despite tribulations, despite the test, you have, to, you have to have some perseverance on the inside of you. And a great example is the woman with the issue of blood. She had perseverance. She had, to, she, had, she had gone to everybody she knew how to go to. She had tried every doctor. She tried everything she knew how to try. But she had to persevere her way to the Savior that she might receive her healing. We live in a world where living by kingdom principles like love, humility, self-sacrifice can be difficult, especially when we see those who are not committed to the kingdom work prospering. Amen. Sometimes we're able to see those who are not living the truth, who are not living the word of God out like you live it out. Sometimes it, it, it kind of it, it scares us a little bit that they are still prospering. They're still making it. Amen. Some of the PPP folks still ain't went to jail. Amen. And you, you were hoping that they, the government got them. You said that you, oh, they're going to get them. They're going to get them. Amen. But you can't let that get in the way of you persevering. Amen. But perseverance is necessary to resist the temptations of materialism, selfishness, or fear, which often challenges kingdom values. There is bless, a blessing attached to our perseverance. How can you be sure about it? Because there are countless examples 
of those who persevered and who were blessed because of it. Jacob, uh, excuse me, Joseph, the son of Jacob, Joseph's brothers hated him to the point of planning his death. Amen. They participated in his downfall, although in the end they sold him to the Ishmael, Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt as a slave. He was purchased by Potiphar, captain of Pharaoh's guard, who left all that he had in Joseph's hands. Later, after being falsely accused of trying to abuse Potiphar's wife, Joseph was imprisoned. He remained captive for 13 years and did not see his family again for 22 years. After many trials, Joseph would have to be justified in giving, would have been justified in giving up and saying, what, is it, what use is it to serve God if my reward is only punishment? Sometimes serving God feels like punishment. Have you ever been there where you felt like you were in punishment serving God? Because you can't, you can't, you can't do everything that the world does. You can't go everywhere that the world go, uh, goes. You cannot wear everything that the world wears. But you got to be you got to got to persevere in doing it God's way. Amen. Nevertheless, Joseph persevered in his faithfulness to God. In the end, his perseverance bore wonderful fruit. It blessed the lives of the Egyptians and the Hebrews, and the progress and maturity he achieved were ample compensation for his suffering. The Apostle Paul, one time persecuted the Christians, and later Tyler's disciple, who was brave and faithful in teaching the truth, he appeared before kings bearing testimony of the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, sensing beforehand that his end was near. He wrote, for I am now ready to be offered up and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Hence, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but unto all them also that love his appearing. These individuals were all imperfect human beings living in a world of reality sim similar to ours. They, have, they had life challenges just like we had life challenges. They had struggles just like we have struggles. They faced real life opposition just like we face real life opposition, but they persevered. If they had given up in the process, they would have never experienced the blessing that was attached to their perseverance. If you're going to be committed to this thing called the kingdom culture church, to your calling, to your purpose, to your assignment, you have to have perseverance. Because remember that the devil does not desire for us to operate to our fullest potential. Amen? Amen? It is not the devil's desire that you operate to your fullest potential. He is on a, an assignment every single day to stop the assignment of God on your life. But when you have perseverance, you learn that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And you can tell that the enemy, you can tell the enemy that you can't stop me. You can't turn me. You cannot run me. And you can persevere your way through the attacks, through the distractions, through the reproaches, through the opposers, because the devil will send messengers, church. Amen. Just like God has messengers, God has angels, the devil has angels, uh, uh, angels and messengers as well. Amen. And the devil will send those to distract you. The devil will send individuals to throw you off task and to throw you off focus. Amen. But you have to have enough willpower on the inside that says that I'm going to persevere my way through it. Amen. The parables of the hidden treasure teach that the kingdom is worth giving up everything. However, making such sacrifices requires perseverance. We are called to continually pursue God's kingdom even when it requires letting go of things we value or when we are facing discomfort. Jesus taught that entering the kingdom of God is a narrow path, which means that it is not always easy or popular. Amen. This, 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 this thing called being a Christian, a real Christian, is not always easy or popular. And you're going to often have to stand by yourself. And you're going to have to be okay with standing by yourself. Amen. You're going to have to be okay with some family members 
dropping by the wayside. You have to be okay with some friends dropping by the wayside so that you may truly operate in your call. Everybody don't understand, amen, your calling. They don't understand the sacrifices that come with the calling, amen, because the calling comes with sacrifices. And everybody won't understand that you can't stay on the phone to 2 a.m. gossiping. They, won't, they, won't, they, don't understand, they won't understand that. But you know what it is that God has called you do, to do. And you know what it takes to fulfill the assignment on your life. Amen. Others may not always understand it, but you have to persevere. Amen. Perseverance is vital because it aligns with the long-term growth and eternal value of the kingdom of God. Amen. I, 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 I'm, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. What would happen to the church of God if everybody made up in their mind they're going to persevere? That they're not going to let nothing get in their way. That I'm going with Jesus all the way. May have some disagreements, but that's not going to stop my perseverance. We may have some issues rise up, but that's not going to stop my perseverance. Some folks may leave and some folks are going to come, but that's still not going to stop my perseverance. What would happen if every member of the body make up in their mind that they're going to persevere? They're not going to let anything get in their way of serving God to their fullest potential. So often we say, uh, we, 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 we complain so much that we don't let perseverance have its perfect work on the inside of us. Because sister such and such is serving over this ministry, I'm not going to serve. But what about your perseverance to God? Does, the, does, that, does that matter? Does it matter who is the president over this ministry or the president over the other if my commitment is to God? Does it matter? It should not matter because, again, our commitment is to God. Our commitment is not to people. And often we commit to people without even knowing that we've committed to people. Because when I wake up with a, a made-up mind that I'm coming to the house to serve the Lord, folks ain't, folks, folks ain't getting in my way. You can't, you can't allow people to get in your way because we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against powers and wickedness that sits in high places, the devil will grab hold to anybody that he can grab hold to. And when you make up, wake up in the, in the morning with a well-made-up mind that I'm going in Jesus' name, you better know that the devil coming behind you in his name. But the first attack of the enemy, are you going to let that stop you from doing, it, doing what it is? If I made up in my mind, I'm going to the house to serve, the first when you, when you learn the devil, you learn his, ta his tactics. You know when the devil is attacking you. You know when the devil is trying to stop you. You know when the devil is trying to block you. Because we say it all the time, the devil tried to stop me from getting here, but I made it. Amen. So we have to, we have to really put our focus on who it is that we're persevering for. We're not persevering for people. We're persevering for God's kingdom, that his kingdom, thy kingdom may come, that his kingdom may be edified, that lives may be forever changed. And what, what if, what if, what if somebody's way to the Father is connected to you, but you've made up in your mind because she's sitting in my seat, I'm going home. Because she parked in my parking spot, I ain't going to church today. Because it's raining outside, I'm not going. We'll make up any excuse not to get to this house. When we don't know who it is that we're committed to. Amen. Amen. Let's talk about the sower, the sower. The kingdom of God flourishes when there is a receptive and responsive heart. The parable of the sower highlights different types of hearts, which is referred to in the text as soils that receive the word of God, the seed. 
in the parable of the sower, Jesus describes four different types of soils, each representing a different response to the word of God. These soils illustrate the conditions of people's hearts and how they respond to the message of the kingdom. Amen. We've got to make sure that our hearts are right and our hearts are ready and willing to, to, to serve. Amen. You, can, you can't serve. You can, but you're going to make a mess when your heart is not right and you're trying to do kingdom work. You're going you're to make a mess because your heart has to be, your, your heart has to be right and it has to be in the right place. Amen. Some seeds fell along the path, which is known as the hardened soil, and the birds came and ate it up. The path represents a hardened heart that is resistant to God's word like seeds that cannot penetrate the compacted soil of a well-trodden path, the message of the kingdom doesn't take root. The birds eating the seeds symbolizing, symbolizes the evil one, Satan, who quickly snatches away the word before it can begin to work in a person's heart. Amen. When you have a hardened heart, the word can't do no work. When, when your heart is hardened, when you already made up in your heart that if she says something to me, because we do this in church, <laughs> a, amen, I, I'm, 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 I'm talking about for real. Amen. One, <laughs> one of our members came up to me and she said that I, if such and such and such say something to me again, I'm going I'm to I'm swing on her in church. We can't, we can't do that. We can't do that. When you've already made up in your heart that this is what you're going to do, this is going to be your response. You cannot, you, cannot, you cannot have a hard heart. What we should be praying for is that God takes over. First, we need to be praying for the individual that we've got a problem with. If you got a problem with such and such, such and such, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta start praying. Because I've learned that prayer can go where we cannot go, and prayer can do what we cannot do. Again, we spend a lot of energy fighting flesh. We fight each other hard, and we forget that word that says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You're not fighting your brother and your sister. You're fighting the devil. That's who we all should be fighting, the enemy. And how do we defeat the enemy? We pray to God. We put the word of God on the situation. But responding out of flesh is not going to get us anywhere. You got to have, have, have a soft heart. You can't have a hard heart because the word cannot take root in a hard heart. Amen? Amen. How? How is the word going to sink? And it, can't, it cannot penetrate. So what's the reality, preacher? You, you, you're, you're never going to hear the word of God when the preacher gets up and preaches what God has given if your heart is already hard. You're never going to hear the word of God if you've already made up in your mind that you don't need the word, that you've got it already worked out yourself that you're going to take matters into your own hands. Mm -hmm. The word of God cannot, it cannot work. Okay, the hard heart represents people who hear the word, but do, do not understand it. Their hearts are closed off due to pride, unbelief, or distraction. The word near never penetrates, therefore no growth or change can take place. If the word cannot penetrate your heart, the word cannot do any work. Amen. I'm going to say it again. If your heart is hard, the word cannot penetrate. Therefore, no change or growth can take place. Amen. People who with hardened hearts may be indifferent or dismissive towards spiritual matters. They may hear the gospel, but immediately reject it. Often due to preconceived beliefs or refusal to trust God. Then there is the shallow heart. 
caught the rocky soil. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. The rocky soil represents a person who received the word, of the word with joy but only has a shallow commitment. The seed sprouts quickly because the soil is shallow. And when the sun comes out, symbolizing trials and persecution, when the rain comes, the plant withers because it has no deep roots. This person is enthusiastic at first, but lacks the depth to endure hardships. The rocky, the rocky soil, the shallow heart. Amen. Can't, can't endure anything. But there are times where you have to endure to the end. You got, you got, you got to, you got to endure. I mean, like not giving up in the middle. And we 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 have encountered shallow-hearted people. Time to go and get rough. They don't they don't they don't want no parts. Amen. But we got to commit ourselves to not having a shallow heart, but taking, growing our roots deep, roots deep in God that we may be able to withstand the tests and trials of life, okay? Then there's the, thorn, the thorny soil. The thorny soil is the distracted heart. Other seeds fell upon uh, among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. The thorny soil represents a person who hears the word but the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things choke the word, making it unfruitful. The thorny soil. The thorn symbolizing distractions, materialism, and worldly concern that prevents spiritual growth. The seed grows, but it eventually over, it is overtaken by these distractions, rendering it ineffective. Amen. The thorny soil. You, you, you cannot let the worries of life steal your joy. And often that's, that's hard to say. But you cannot let what you're going through hinder you and hinder your commitment. You can't, you can't let it get in the way of you giving your all to God. Amen. So often we, 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 let our, we let our worries get in the way and we forget that what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Worry will kill you. Worrying. When, you, when, you, when, you, when you've made up in your mind that you're going to let God do it, you got to let God do it. And that's a, that's a learned behavior because we have learned how to put our hands on it. And we got to learn how to take our hands off of it. We've learned how to do it our way for so long. We, we did it our way for so long. But when we come on the Lord's side and become children of God, we got our, our fathers fighting for us. Our fathers defending for us. Defending us. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. We can't take matters into our own hands. But we got to allow God to do it. Amen. Then there's the good soil that represents the receptive heart. Still, others, still other seeds fell on, still fall on good soil, where it is produced, where it produces a crop, a hundred, some sixty, some thirty, what was sown. The good soil represents a receptive and obedient heart that fully embraces the word of God. The seed not only takes root but grows deep and strong producing a significant harvest. This person hears, understands, and applies the word leading to a fruitful life. Represents a person, the, 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 the receptive part represents a person who is open to God's word and willing to respond with God's obedience. Amen. The seeds falling on good ground, you gotta have, you gotta have a receptive heart. You can't be closed off. If you're good soil, if the seeds are going to fall 
on good soil. And when you're planting in good soil, you can't be closed off saying what God won't do. What the folks will not do. You got you to gotta, you gotta believe that God is more than able to do it seeding and abundantly above all that I can ask or think. And if he's able to do it for you, what makes you think that he's not able to do it for your brother or your sister? Amen. You got you to you you commit yourself to being good soul, which is the receptive heart. The receptive heart knows how to take criticism. Amen. The receptive heart knows how to forgive. The receptive heart knows how to forgive others. And the receptive heart knows how to, uh, how to not always be offended, to take criticisms and to receive correction without always being offended. Sometimes uh, people like being offended. I've learned that. People want to, I want to I be offended. Because being offended makes people the victim, and everybody loves to play the victim. Everybody loves to play the victim. But when you have a receptive heart, it's not a struggle for you to say that I'm sorry. I got that wrong. I didn't get it right. I misspoke. When you have a receptive heart, and then it's not, it's not, it's not a struggle for you to say I forgive you for what you did to me. Even if you don't feel bad about what you did or how you treated me, I forgive you. That's the receptive. It's a receptive heart. Because the receptive heart, the receptive heart loves the word of God. But not only loves the word of God, but applies the word of God. What does the word of God say about forgiveness? If you're not, if you're not committed to forgiving others, how can you expect God to forgive you? And often we like explanations from people. I don't need no explanation for you. When God has already put it in my heart to forgive, I don't need no explanation from you. You don't need any explanation from the offender when God has put it in your heart to forgive. You forgive and you go on about your business. Understanding that at some point you were the offender. Okay, we don't want to talk about that. Sometimes we, we forget that just like we offended, sometimes we were the offender. We offended people. And the receptive heart, those who have good soil, they should want to be forgiven by their brothers and their sisters. If you wrong somebody, how, you, how can you go to sleep and you have not gotten it right? If you know in your heart, because the Holy Spirit, once you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, you are the first person who knows. And we cannot lie on the Holy Spirit. When you've been wrong, you've been wrong. And I just believe that when you're wrong, the Holy Spirit is, a, is, 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 is in order to apologize, right? So if you know that you've been wrong, you're telling me the Holy Spirit ain't never told you to apologize. And you know that you've been wrong. If you've been wrong and offended, the Holy Spirit is going to give you direction to correct your wrong. That's the order of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not ever going to be in error. But when you, when you have good soil, when you're rooted in good soil, you're committed to doing it God's way versus your way. It won't always, it won't always be your way. Amen. These are all the different types of soil. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. This is rhetorical. You take this and you do what you want to do with it. You ain't got to tell nobody. Amen. But what type of soil are, are you? What type of soil are you? How, question before we leave, how can we, as the kingdom citizens, live a life committed to being good soil? How can we live a life committed to being good soil? Amen. Because his word, we can live by his word. Amen. Take his word in every situation and matters of our life. Amen. I agree. Uh, persevering. Persevering. Mm 
Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody else? All right. Each type of soil challenges us to reflect on the condition of our own heart. Are we allowing God's word to take root and produce fruit? Or are we being hindered by hardness, shallowness, and distractions? This parable calls us to cultivate hearts that are open, that are deep, and that are undivided, so that the kingdom of God can grow in us and through us. Only the good soil produces fruit, emphasizing that the kingdom takes root in those who are open to hearing and obeying God's word. Jesus shows that the kingdom growth isn't automatic. It depends on the condition of our hearts and how we respond to the message. Distractions, lack of commitment, and a hardened heart pre prevent fruit fruitful growth. Amen. My brother, are you saying that I, I'm out of time? <laughs> are you saying I have five more minutes? I have five minutes, okay. You, you said this, I said, that looked like zero. Okay, all right. To be a part of God's kingdom, we must cultivate a heart that is built on good soil, the heart that is ready to receive his holy, his holy word fully and consistently. This means removing distractions, deepening our roots in faith, and persevering through challenges. We are now going to look at the tears. The tears. Amen. We're not going to, uh, we're going to move very, very quickly. We're not going to read it, but for your study time, you can read the um, 13th chapter of Matthew, Matthew 24 through 30, okay? And this sums up the kingdom it's, is mixed with uh, good and evil, amen? The kingdom exists well and is a world where good and evil grow side by side, but God will separate the tares from the wheat in his own timing, amen? This is why it, it, it should not matter to you what the evil is doing. Amen, because so often we get distracted by the wicked. And David, David, David got distracted by the wicked. Amen, he said his feet had almost gone. His steps were almost well nigh slipped. For he was envious at the foolish when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. He saw the bands, their bands, no bands in their death, but their strength was firm. They were not, they, they, they didn't face any trouble or no plagues. Pride compassed them about as change. Violence covered them as garments. It was painful for David to watch the success and the prosperity of the wicked. But David said, it was not until I entered the sanctuary of God that I understood their end. For a season, God allows for the unrighteous to put on. He gives them their time to shine, but understand that there is an end to the wicked. There is a season where the tares must grow with the wheat, but don't you ever forget that there's also an appointed season where the separation has already been prepared. Amen. Where God will separate the tares from the wheat. The tares, those who do evil, versus the wheat, those who do righteous. 
Amen. This is why it is necessary for you to persevere despite what you see, despite those sitting in high places, because God knows the real from the fake. He knows the righteous from the unrighteous, and he is the perfect judge. Amen. All of us got to stand before the judgment one day. And you ain't got to, you, you ain't got to give no account to uh, your brother, your sister. You got to give an account to God. The God who sits high and looks low, the God who neither slumbers nor sleeps, he sees all. Amen. Even our deepest thoughts. Amen. So he is the one that we ought to be trying to align ourselves up with as closely as possible. That when we stand before the judgment, we can stand confident that we have done what it is that God has asked for us to do. We have been the child of God that God has asked for us. We have obeyed the word of God as God has asked for us to do. And we don't have to, we don't have to stand before the judgment trembling. We can stand confidently. Amen. Then um, uh, in your spare time, read chapter 13, 31 through 32. Quick synopsis. This is the parable of the mustard seed. Amen. Which basically uh, this, that this part of the lesson emphasizes that the kingdom often starts small but has great influence. Amen. Your, your work and your labor often may seem like you're uh, doing a small task and it may not seem that you're being appreciated or valued. But understand that when you sow your seeds into good ground, there, there's going to be a good harvest. A seed starts small, but produces a harvest. So sometimes your small efforts, even just praying for your brothers and sisters, even when you don't have to give, uh, when, when it's time to give at church, do what it is that you can do. Do what it is that you can do. Even if you cannot take your brother or sister, they don't, they, if they've been sick, if you can't take anything by their house, pray, pray for them. Do what, do what you can do, and God is going to bless your efforts. And before you know it, the, the, small, the thing that you consider small, God will make it. He'll, take it. he'll make it large. How do you know, Pastor? Because he took two fish and five loaves of bread, and he fed 5,000 men. Amen? Amen. So he's, a, he's the God of the small, but he'll do great things. Amen. We submit this as our lesson titled, Seek first the kingdom of God. Amen. Tonight we talked about the kingdom characteristics. Through this lesson, God emphasizes that the kingdom, that kingdom living is about aligning our hearts and living out his values, persevering through trials, and trusting that he is at work even when we cannot see immediate results. Just as like a farmer must be patient for harvest, we must, too, be patient, trusting that God is faithfully growing his kingdom in us and through us. Amen. Amen. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this lesson that teaches us, taught us, God, about characteristics of the kingdom, that we must learn how to persevere, even when the going gets tough and the going gets rough, when trials come and the heels come, when uh, when, when the obstacles present themselves and the challenges arise, God, we must be persistent in perseverance. So it is our prayer, our sincere prayer, God, that you would teach us, God, because sometimes we don't know how to persevere our way through the, the, the troubles of life. But, God, we ask, God, that you would stand with us, stand beside us, God. Help us to persevere our way through, God. Help us to Look up in a steadfast hope, God. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you, God. Help us, O oh God, to look to the hills from which cometh all of our help. For truly all of our help cometh from you. O oh God, we ask God that you would continue, God, to grow us in your word. O oh God, lead us and guide us every day, God. Make us who you want us to be, God. O oh God, and then help us, God, to recommit ourselves to you, Lord God to holy living, to righteousness, God. Help us, God. We can't do it by ourselves because you know, God, that we're still wrapped up in our flesh. But we have the helper, God. You are our helper. Oh, God, we can lean on you, God, when we're weak, and you can, you're going to be our strength, God. We can lean on you when we lack, God, and you're going to be the provision. Oh, God, we thank you, God, now 
for who you are, who you've been, and who you're going to always be. We pray for safe travel back to all the state places. In the master's name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. 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 Amen.